This is the Op4 War Games base at Fort Polk, Louisiana, USA. Op4 stands for Opposing Force, an exercise unit that puts 50,000 soldiers through their paces every year. The men who train at Fort Polk are called the Blue Force. Their challenge is to survive 21 days of the most realistic combat scenarios that instructors can throw at them. Three solid weeks in the field, facing an unpredictable adversary across unknown terrain. Every gun on the battlefield is fitted with a sensor to register hits. Laser tagging for professionals. This is the miles gear, and every, every uh, soldier have the miles gear on, they also have it on their helmets. And every weapon system has a laser on it. When the soldier is successfully engaged by some sort of a weapon system, then his miles uh, will go off in a, in a tone. And then that, that alerts the observer controllers that in fact uh, the individual has been hit. At, at that point in time, he pulls out his casualty card. The casualty card may say that he was killed in action. And, and in other cases, it may say that he was wounded, and then how he was wounded. Then that gives the medical folks a training aspect so that they can use that in their own, own training as we conduct the medical evacuation off the battlefield. But every system has the laser systems, the, the Stinger and the Avenger has the mild laser on it. And when successfully engaged, uh, a tone will go off in the hind helicopter that will alert them that they, in fact, were shot down. The airborne enemy the trainees will face are named Red Force, a team of OP4 instructors, masters of the tactics and technologies of the armed forces of the former Soviet Union. We're being brought in to repel the aggressors, the blue aggressors, those running dogs. So we, we will come in and uh, come in hard, low, fast, and hit the targets. And, uh, as, as quickly and as hard as we can do it. This, by far, is the most fearsome weapon at the Red Force's disposal. An MI-24 assault helicopter captured from Iraqi troops in the Gulf War. At the height of the Cold War, it was codenamed Hind by NATO planners. Thousands of these gunship transporters were built to destroy Allied tanks on the battlefields of Europe in World War III. Instead, it has seen combat in countless wars and conflicts across the Third World. Ironically, it now serves as a teaching instrument for the army it was built to destroy. Most of these gunners, it's the first time you've seen a Hind. They've seen an Apache, and they know how the Apache attack helicopter works. But this is Hind, it's something different. You know, this thing is going to take a good attack run, it's going to start coming screaming at you, and all of a sudden it break out of the trees, and there it is, and it's shooting the missiles, and it's shooting its machine guns, and then it's gone. The Hind pilots fly in the most heavily armored helicopter gunship the world has ever seen. They're protected by a titanium strong box of a cockpit, built to withstand point-blank hits from 37mm anti-aircraft shells. The windscreens themselves are bulletproof. Even if the glass was riddled with a 50 caliber machine gun, the two pilots would survive and probably complete their mission. The cockpit itself is a large, roomy cockpit. The switches are simple, clearly marked. It's air-conditioned. It's got a nice fan up in front for airflow, keeping it across your face. And in stress, you, you like to have airflow across your face. It's overpressurized, and it's chemically and biologically filtered air, so you're in a safe environment to you have holes knocked in it. So it's quite a large, comfortable cockpit. The Soviets had relied upon sheer weight of numbers to achieve military superiority. High-tech weaponry was never favored because of the intricate backup systems required by such machinery. The helicopter the Russians have inherited was designed by the Mill Company and first flown in 1971 and has proved itself to be a highly competent piece of weaponry. Nearly two times larger than America's Apache gunship, the Hind has no real Western counterpart. 
Soviet military doctrine had combined the speed of an attack helicopter with the size of a transporter. The result was a hybrid larger than most World War II bombers and at 340 kilometers per hour, the fastest military chopper ever made. Faster even than the highly maneuverable Apache. I wouldn't say it's a sneaky uh, type of aircraft. 26,000 pounds is not gonna sneak up on pretty near anybody, but it is quiet in comparison to its size. And it moves, we move at a high speed, attack speed between 120 and 140 knots, 50 to 100 feet above the ground. And a rolling terrain, it's very difficult to detect. And it can be on you before you know it. This morning we expect the MI-24 Hind to conduct an air attack. The air attack route will go up along the east side of the brigade sector. It will fly north, proposed targets at mark point 706, 705, 704, and the brigade supply area. On this training exercise, the soldiers of the 25th Infantry Division face a difficult job. Plunged deep into enemy territory, they must hold a riverbed running through their sector of the map. Along the way, they'll be subjected to ambush and attack by helicopter-borne Reds. The hind pilots will not fly alone. Included in the Red Force are MI-17 Hiplite and MI-8 attack helicopters. To defend against these threats, each platoon has its own Avenger team. A Humvee fitted with Mach 2 Stinger surface-to-air missiles. Hind pilots hug the trees, seek their prey and strike swiftly. This gives each team an average of just three seconds to get off a shot. If this were war, these men would already be dead. It's not good enough in our army just to tell somebody, I want you to do this, and I want you to do it now. You got to tell the soldier why. You know, what's the purpose? What are we doing here? Down the lowest level. He or she has an idea why we're out here. What's the whole purpose? What's the end game? And then the how is left up to them. And you trust them that they'll be able to apply that how, but it's the why. Again, I think that's, that's probably one of the things that's unique about our army. This is definitely the most realistic training that, uh, that I've ever seen in, uh, in 14 years in the army. So this, this is great. And in our home station, we really don't have aircraft that engage back at us. So uh, we'll be on our toes as to more of what we're doing. Okay, he got it. Up four pilots fly five to six times daily. For the Stinger teams below, this constant cycle of attack forces them to sharpen their defensive skills to a fine edge. By the time a rotation is over, it's almost like we don't want to go out in the box anymore. You get whacked three or four times a day, that's... Well, you know, we're, we're, we are pretty good at what we do, and uh, to, get, to get shot up pretty regular doesn't do a whole lot for your ego. It's a really good feeling when uh, you've gone out in, a, in, a, in, the, in the battlefield, the battle area, and you've given it all you've got, and you've flown it to the maximum potential, and you've shot your ordnance, and you still get whacked and shot down. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel real good. The Hind is adept at training the soldier of tomorrow. Though for thousands of such machines, their past is anything but a bloodless affair. I don't know about this one, but you know, you do wonder who, who sat in here, and you wonder where they are now, what they're doing now. Would they be surprised if they knew that what the aircraft was doing now? A lot of legacy to a piece of equipment like this that, that we're not even aware of, you wonder. You wonder. At the United Nations, the Security Council was presented with a resolution calling for the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all foreign troops from Afghanistan. For the Russians, this was not an invasion. 
just a helping hand to a nation in need. In December 1979, two Soviet divisions entered Afghanistan. The communist puppet state installed by Moscow was under siege from the seven Islamic tribes of the Mujahideen. The Afghans were incensed by a communist imposed ideology that denied the existence of Allah. This would be the first real test of the Russian army since the Second World War. Suddenly seeing all these young conscripts out on the airbase, and they were all 18, 19, 20 years old, they were all trying to grow moustaches. And in a sense, this is like Vietnam déjà vu. In the early years, the Afghanistan war was left unreported in the Soviet-controlled media. In the early 80s, if you thumb through magazines and newspapers that were covering the war in Afghanistan, basically you get it, an impression that Soviet soldiers in Afghanistan were raising flowers or picking flowers, or constructing schools or kindergartens, and nothing else. We were built by the colonel who was still had the Afghan, Afghanistan dust on his shoulders. He just, he told us, guys, I don't care what the hell did they tell you in Moscow now. Let's talk about real situation. By late 1980, over 100,000 Soviets were fighting and dying in Afghanistan. But when the bodies of the dead returned home, families were told that their sons and brothers had perished in training accidents. Throughout the war, the Soviets held Afghanistan's few cities, while the Mujahideen guerrilla army controlled the surrounding countryside. The region is mountainous. Much of the country sits above 3,000 meters. In attempts to project power beyond the cities, the Soviets scattered firebases across the land. Supply and reinforcement were difficult. Afghanistan's deep gorges and narrow mountain passes proved a nightmare to Moscow's conventional army. Soviet convoys found themselves under constant threat of sudden ambush by an enemy that was as elusive as it was destructive. In the rugged terrain, the Red Army came to rely more heavily on one machine than any other. Like the American conflict in Vietnam before, Afghanistan became a helicopter war. And like the Huey in Vietnam, one aircraft became symbolic of the manner in which the war was fought. The Hind is powered by twin turbine 2200 horsepower engines. Its combat range is almost 800 kilometers. The gunner sits in the front seat and the pilot in the rear. The transport compartment can carry eight troopers, but is more often used to store extra ordnance. The stub wings add 25% more lift in high-speed flight, reduce the chopper's turning radius, and can be hung with four 32-shot rocket pods. In front, the hind wields a four-barreled 12.7mm Gatling gun. Over time, the Mi-24 evolved into a pure attack gunship.
It seldom carried troops except in an emergency, and it was usually left to MI-17s and MI-8s to evacuate soldiers from the ground. You are in trouble, and if he's not getting you out of there, that's the end of it. And even when you're on board, you just hold your breath and count all along seconds before you feel that the altitude and probably the distance is long enough so you can slowly exhale and relax. In many ways, the MI-24 was a product of the American debacle in Vietnam. US Army studies following the war in Southeast Asia concluded that America's Huey helicopter was both underpowered and extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. In the early 1970s, Soviet designers sifted through these studies and learned from their conclusions. The result is an exceptionally fast machine that is nearly impervious to 50 caliber machine gun fire. And that was really something dreadful. And then you will fire on it and uh, it will have no, no effect. You could see that sparking of hitting it and getting uh, sparks and still it will come at you. I literally love it because uh, more than once it uh, uh, saved my life and it was hit with the bullets and shells or all, all around and uh, still uh, well it uh, carried my my body <laughs> back to the base Soviet tactics often replicated the strategic operations employed by the Americans in Vietnam. Hours prior to a hind assault on a suspect village, Soviet troops were inserted into hidden posts along the village's most likely path of escape. The hinds would pop up from behind the mountain peak with the sun rising and the winds blowing into their direction and this is like a this is like a, here comes the nightmare. You, you could scare, you, you, uh, you know, even Afghan Mujahideen, they were very brave. They were very good fighters. They didn't care even if they're dead or alive, you know. But you can see that feeling everyone, that the way the helicopter was coming to you, it's, uh, you can get that feeling like oh, it's something coming to me, you know. When they fled from the incoming choppers, the Afghans were ambushed as they stumbled headlong into the Red Army paratroopers lying in wait. By 1983, the Heinz were roaming over the Afghan countryside, seeking targets at will. Soviet pilots named themselves the Grey Wolves, while the guerrillas below christened them the Garbak, or the Spectres. We were told that we had free hunting, that we should go off and shoot any people not using official roads. But it wasn't right. What if a man in the desert is just moving to the nearest village? When we first came, some people felt okay about us. But in a year or so, that changed. For Soviet pilots, distinguishing civilian from combatant was often difficult. For leaders in Moscow, the distinction was inconsequential. Kremlin planners devised a strategy that many called genocidal. Villages were bombed to empty the countryside of the people who fed, clothed and sheltered the rebel fighters. If the Soviets had learned anything from the American experience in Vietnam, it didn't show. 
terror tactics only strengthened the resolve of the enemy. There were incidents where, you know, villagers were taken out and just shot or bulldozed. That was a very common one where tanks would just run over uh, bodies. Quite a lot of documentary evidence came out about that. With, you know, children uh, <coughs> buried alive through bombings. Um, again, deliberate attacks against villagers, sometimes as punishment for attacks by the guerrillas. Anything against land, community, faith, and honor calls for fighting to death. It is in the character of every Afghan, I mean just to fight. And from the beginning, I had some friends here in the state, I told them, that uh, the Afghans will fight to the last man. And they did, and I was not wrong. The Afghans simply became more determined in the face of escalating violence. The Afghans could travel on bread and tea, and could travel for days, weeks, even months on this you know, very basic form of nutrition and they seem to have this extraordinary resilience for living on very, very little. For the Soviet troops, the resilience of their helicopter comrades was fast becoming legendary. Experience, like what the hell, what do they experience when we were covering our heads under the fire and those guys just sitting in this, without anything they can do to protect themselves. Pilots spent much of their time flying convoy escorts and over time earned the respect of the troops that they're sent to protect. Their strongest bond was with the heliborne troops they would carry into battle. So airborne it was like a twin brothers and I especially respected that they never used their chutes when they were flying us for sorties. So if Bush comes to show, we were in the same boat and they would not take any extra chances to save themselves or to leave us to just to drop us in the deep shit alone. Hind pilots often flew on what they called roadrunner missions. In order to present as brief a target as possible, they'd spend much of their time flying just above the ground as small arms fire posed little danger to the thickly armoured chopper. But by 1984, the Mujahideen had learned a new trick. They took a weapon designed to penetrate the thick armour of Soviet tanks and directed it skywards. Another unexpected thing we encountered there were the usage of uh, hand uh, grenade launchers against helicopters which uh, were intended to fire uh, at tanks but uh, at helicopters at low altitude they had lots of grenade launchers and a modja head could just raise it and fire at you with a grenade and there were many cases like that you see the, the helicopters will come high if you fire it like this the blast will kill you, you or at least injure you so what we did we will have these long, uh, tall trees, a poplar or some sort of a pine. On the top of it, a mujahid will climb and climb and climb. And usually there will not be strong uh, branches to hold him. So what we will do, we will tie him up to the tree and then wait for the helicopters to come with the, with the RPGs. And there have been cases that we shot the hinds with the RPGs. Over time, the Mujahideen, like the Viet Cong before them, learned that pilots notice field movement. Running from incoming helicopters was suicidal. Once the guerrillas stood their ground, it was the Soviets who suffered. 
Hind pilot Valery Burkov entered combat in Afghanistan just two months after his father died flying an Mi-24 mission. Another Mi-24 was shot down and my father decided to land his chopper and try and save the downed crew. But when he was coming in, his hind too was hit in the fuel tank. So the helicopter exploded and started to burn. And he was the only one of the crew who didn't manage to get out. He burned up in the machine. Eventually, the Heinz weaknesses began to show. The altitudes in Afghanistan are extreme. Some Soviet fire bases were located as high as five and a half thousand meters. The thin air took its toll on turbine engines built to work no higher than 4,000 meters. This sometimes cut the helicopter's speed by as much as two-thirds. More often, it meant that the heavy, armor-plated machine couldn't take off like a real helicopter, but would lumber down a short runway to get airborne. When pilots complained, Moscow and the mill company took no real action. Russia's idea was always to make a uh, more cheap aircraft. The more the better, the cheaper the better. Uh, pilots were expendable. In the Soviet communist ideology, people were expendable anyway. And the most expendable were the draftees in the convoys below. Now, most of these conscripts were non-Russian, ethnic Russian. They tended to be Georgian, Ukrainian, uh, from the Baltic states, Estonians, uh, Lithuanians. So there was a degree of resentment toward the Russians, toward Moscow. Also, most of the conscripts hadn't any idea why they were covering or why they were involved in this war. As I understand, Moscow tried to save more Russian kids because there was... the Russian population was not growing as fast as the population of Asian republics. And I think it was a very cynical policy of uh, Moscow leaders. So I think there was a lot of resentment uh, amongst the conscripts. They didn't really believe in this war. For many in combat, this sense of detachment would soon change. For most of the guys, they were more or less indifferent until they experienced personal casualties among their friends or they were wounded. Then, by blood, they were committed to this vicious circle of cannon fodder. Once you lose your buddies, peers, with whom you had a personal uh, experience sharing your life, uh, your service, then you just start from there. Then for you, it's like the whole damn thing personifies in the faces of those who, were peri who perished. And re their revenge is the word. That's it. And for them, it's, there is no difficulties, no doubts. It's as simple as that. They killed my body. Now you watch me. I think the fear element had grown. I think also the fear element had grown with the Soviets because word did come back of what happened. And if you look at the Soviet propaganda, which a lot of it was, was probably not that far off the mark, that if you got captured, they would skin you alive. And I always remember this being one particular element, that they would skin you alive, and it, it did happen. not a very nice war and you know I talked a great deal with both Soviet prisoners and Afghans themselves and I usually carried a copy of the Geneva Conventions a cartoon book in my pocket to try and explain to the Afghans that you know they they should not kill prisoners this was not part of the game and most Afghans really couldn't see the logic in this they said well you know if we keep prisoners we have to feed them and they're bombing us they're killing us so why should we keep them alive 
you know, which you know, was, was their point of view and probably from their point of view also you know, justified that they'd lost uh, loved ones. Just to dampen the morale of our soldiers, they would throw the live body of one of our prisoners with his legs and arms cut off and still bleeding. And as soon as the column stops and the guys would check out what the hell is going on, they would usually they would put it like from in the big box from the from missiles, and it is open. And then the whole story is just like a wildfire spreads all the, all along the column, and uh, you just can. What look at the faces of the young soldiers, how they turn pale, and some of them just tremble. And uh, it's hard to measure to what extent it affects the combat readiness, but uh, usually, well, I believe you understand what I'm talking about. It just fortified the views of those spend some time there. It, it gave them ugly justification for atrocities on our side. So for us it was very simple. When we dealt with the POWs, we would have only very limited options. He cooperates with us. If he doesn't want, he would be wasted on the spot. That's it. Nothing fancy. No slicing, no knifing, anything like that. With each passing month, combat in Afghanistan was turning ever more savage. By 1986, even the children of the Mujahideen were fighting the Soviets. Such conflicts had no respect for age. Unlike the Hind, most Soviet helicopters flew without heavy armor and bulletproof glass. One of our uh, medevac helicopters was shot down by a teenager. And after he was killed, it turned out that he was no elder than probably 13 or 12 years old. When he shot the pilot, a bullet struck him right between his eyes from uh, probably around to 250 yards and he was and he he had enough guts to shoot from such a close range and to take all uh, and pro I'm sure he had a pretty understanding what would happen with him and he took the risks so we developed the feeling of just respect to professionalism to the other side. By 1986, the CIA were supplying the rebels with the Stinger missile. Capable of hitting a moving target five kilometers away, it represented a massive threat. The general dynamic Stinger weighs just 15 kilograms, flies twice the speed of sound, and can reach aircraft flying five kilometers away. There was a perception in the CIA that the rebels were not technologically advanced enough to utilize such a weapon. But the guerrillas were quick learners and the new missile proved deadly to the Soviet air crews. One resistance commander remarked, there are only two things we Afghans need, the Quran and more stingers. Well, you see, the uh, basis for 10 years of war didn't change, and uh, we used one and the same basis. So, however, you would uh, change the routes uh, leading out of the base and back to the base, the directions were still the same. Uh, so, Mujahids built up uh, fortified positions in the mountains 
on the general directions of our approach to the airfields and uh, our routes leaving the airfields. And especially when they got stingers, uh, they had people literally sitting with stingers, and if not in a day, then in a month, at this particular point, uh, an aircraft would appear and would be shot at. The most dangerous time was around 1986. We lost a third of our men and a half of all our helicopters. Most of the guys lost were in MI-8s, because they are most vulnerable during landings and takeoffs in enemy territory. By 1987, flare dispensers had been added to most Soviet helicopters. They acted as decoys to the heat-seeking missiles. Fixed-wing aircraft, too, utilize this system. Despite this, in 1987 alone, more than 200 Soviet aircraft fell prey to the Mujahideen's new weapon. On, almost on a daily basis, they would have a glass of vodka filled up with a piece of bread, a candle and it would be like you know, like a funeral or far away party for somebody else who was shot. I had the first experience being ambushed and we had a huge casualty rate. 47 killed, and we had uh, six guys who were just bleeding and dying from the wounds, and our two medical personnel were killed too. So we, we didn't have anybody to take care of this wounded guys properly. And we radioed to the base to pick them up. The arrival of the Stinger meant that the helicopters the soldiers looked to for salvation were no longer there when needed. And this is like a waiting situation. I was walking around those uh, guys moaning from their pain and they would uh, provide the first medical aid and uh, I was cursing, I was preaching, I was hoping, and there was nothing else we can do about it. And I thought my head would explode trying to pick up the first uh, uh, sound, sounds of the incoming helicopters. This is, I would say, the worst waiting I've ever had in my life. I mean, something I would not uh, I wouldn't like to have anybody get through. The feeling of the mixture of hopelessness and hope at the same time. Not all of them made it when they landed. I had a hard feelings. I was looking somebody to blame and I couldn't put my finger on somebody or something. It was like, it was as big as life. It didn't work out properly. Birds landed safely, but they were useless because guys didn't make when they landed. And it was, well, Everything has to be wonderful and happy and not bloody and stupid. But, and you, sometimes you pretend that you can make wonders, but sometimes you realize that you can do it. Some in Afghanistan claimed that the stingers were more of a psychological threat than a physical one. 
I think the numbers of stingers uh, which actually shot down uh, Soviet planes was quite questionable. I saw probably five or six, and each one I saw being fired missed. And, um, and I think that was the same experience of quite a few of my other colleagues. However, the facts speak for themselves. 1,300 Soviet aircraft were shot down, nearly one-third Mi-24 Heinz. By the winter of 1988, Soviet morale was devastated. There was not much of a discipline in the, their soldiers. Their soldiers were uh, selling their weapon, trading it for something. They were even selling their spare tire of their jeeps. They would sell fuel out of their uh, vehicles. They will uh, sell ammunition. In Moscow, the war was now being freely debated. Glasnost and Perestroika had opened the floodgates. For the first time in Soviet history, public dissent against a war of aggression was openly tolerated. Social fatigue and a crumbling economy was to undermine support for the war. The Soviets then announced their impending withdrawal from Afghanistan. In the months that followed, soldiers in the field focused on one thing, getting home in one piece. Hind pilot Valery Burkov served with ground troops as a forward air controller. When we took over one of the mountains in the Panchir Valley, there was a bunker, a natural bunker in a mountain cavern at the summit. And when we got up there, I went down to this bunker to look for trophies. It was a position for a high-caliber machine gun. And just when I climbed out with my trophies, I stepped on a mine under a rock near the entrance. It seems it was the only mine on that mountain. So when the enemy left that position, they left just one mine. And I stepped on it and it exploded. Burakov lost both his legs in the explosion. A helicopter carried him to safety, and for this he became a hero of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has made a commitment to withdraw completely its forces from Afghanistan no later than February 15, 1989. There is no reason why they should not meet this obligation, and we expect the Soviets to honor the obligations they undertook in signing the Geneva Accords. There is no evidence that they will not do this. In Afghanistan, for some reason, you immediately became an old man just right after you were youth. I've seen eyes on young faces, eyes that should belong to very old people, 80 years old, 90 years old. Those kids, what they saw in Afghanistan was beyond normal human experience. And this was reflected in their eyes. It's like, whew, you made it, it's like, from now on, it's R and R till the end of my life. It, nothing will be as bad as it was. That's it. Today, a small unit of guardsmen was marched onto the runway of Kabul airport. We were excited that we made it. We were there. We made it, and now we're back home. Period. I mean, nothing to worry about. I must tell you that. I, as a correspondent in Afghanistan, went through different stages of understanding of what war is all about. In 1986, I thought that we need another two or three divisions and everything will be okay. In 1987, I thought that even if you send three more armies, you'd still lose the war, and that something is deeply wrong here. And in 1989, I basically thought that this was a war that will not only destroy Afghanistan, but basically the Soviet Union. Historically, the Afghanistan war ended as the Soviet Empire began to disintegrate. 
and there's no doubting that the burden of that conflict contributed to its downfall. The Soviets lost 15,000 troops because of dogmatic principles. As for Afghanistan itself, one and a half million rebels and civilians have died, and the terror continues with warring tribes fighting over the rubble left by the invading Soviets. For me, the hind is a symbol of our Afghan experience. For me, it signifies, you know, like an accumulated force, all the uh, <clears throat> all the brutality, uh, brutality and power, and uh, of this conflict that we experience on both sides and against. The Red Army and the empire that this weapon was built to serve no longer exists. It's ironic that the system the helicopter now operates under is as run down as the helicopter itself. There is a final irony because of the lack of fuel in Russia, the average Russian Federation pilot flies just once a month, making the hind pilots of the Louisiana OP-4 unit the most active MI-24 unit in the world. 